All right, we are live from Occupy City Hall. This is the Live from Occupy City Hall podcast. Uh, I'm here. This is Les. But this is Leslie. I'm here with K. This is K. This is that's K. Uh, this is the premiere episode of Live from Occupy City Hall, uh, the podcast. Uh, in this in this podcast uh, series, which will differ from our uh, first. Pro, uh, podcast series which was a monologue entitled the social construct of leslie where excuse me uh where i have been uh just going back in uh recalling events from may 30th 2020 all the way up to our, our current date here uh, we have three episodes of that podcast out right now uh, that podcast series that are out right now. So if you haven't listened to those episodes, please go and listen to those episodes. Uh, but this podcast series is going to be a little different. Uh, this will uh, be a dialogue. Uh, we will always have a dialogue on the Live from Occupy City Hall podcast, uh, not monologues. Uh, and so uh, I, I've, I've done a little bit of speaking. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it over and let sort of uh, Kay introduce himself since Kay has not introduced himself to the podcast crowd yet. And then I'll do another uh, small introduction of myself as well uh, for people who may uh, may not know, who may listen to this podcast before they listen to the Social Construct of Leslie podcast or before they get a understanding of uh, my role in the movement. Uh, and then after that, we'll dive into some of the more recent events that have taken place uh, at Occupy City Hall in Rockford, Illinois. All right, go ahead, I'll let Kay go ahead and introduce okay. himself. Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. Uh, I go by Kay uh, under the occupation. Um, uh, I think just s simplistically being defined as a protester is not broad enough to explain the full breadth of, uh, of the capacity that I came to the movement in. I'm actually a social activist, uh, not born and raised in Rockford, so I do have a different perspective coming from a much larger and uh, much more progressive city. Uh, just seeing, having a different perspective to come from a larger place and a city that's further along uh, socially as well as other aspects. But uh, What city are you from? I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Um, I haven't really talked much publicly uh, during the initial uh, stages of the, pro uh, the protesting and uh, the occupation. Um, I didn't want... Uh, any of my business endeavors or any of my past history to overshadow or or distract or detract from uh, anything to do with this movement specifically. I just wanted to be an asset, so I really didn't speak much about myself. But I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. I'm a social activist, also a uh, public speaker, background in marketing and advertising uh, for over 20 years. Um, but again, coming to the uh, uh, the May 30th, as far as uh, what took place last year, that's what that was a lightning rod moment in my life. Uh, I I was seeking no no political gain at that time, nor am I still. Uh, I'm not seeking any position with the city, and it's not for any uh, leverage or any clout per se. It, it is uh, for the sake of what's right. And that's that's what brought me uh, to the, the the initial people that were protesting, as well as Leslie and Terry. And I just wanted to be of assistance in a very direct way. Um, and we, we, pre we appreciate and we will always appreciate any donations that people have. People always ask, what can I do? And everyone can uh, work at their own capacity. But I wanted to actually lend my myself uh, in the means of being tactical with the group uh, uh, without going into too much detail. Just having a certain experience, um, I offered myself in a capacity to basically be in the background. Uh, for many of you that were watching the, the protesting, I always wore black. Every I never hid. I never wore a disguise. People ask me, why don't you? wear a disguise there was no point for me to have a disguise because there was no point for me to attempt to disguise myself i never once attempted to disguise myself from any of the politicians nor the police parks department or the sh uh, sheriff's department 
I was readily available at every single uh, city market and uh, every other event. I was very visible in what I had on. There was never a time, nor will there ever be a time, of me being in a disguise because that's that's not the capacity. Some people did that for the sake of their jobs or or um, uh, circumstances, but for me, uh, it's just wearing the the tactical black and just being a part of the movement in this capacity. So even now, it I this as Leslie did say, this is my first really in, not just an introduction for the podcast, but in many ways, this is one of my introductions in speaking. No, yeah, this is uh, uh, as we've been as we've been getting deeper and deeper into into the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and uh, racial injustice in the city of Rockford, Illinois, and in the Winnebago County area. Uh, different members of the or, of our organization, the May Thirtieth Alliance, uh, have been coming into uh, the the role of speaking more. Uh, we want to, as an organization, we believe that everybody has uh, something to say, that everybody's voice is powerful, and that, uh, and, and we believe that the, uh, excuse me, sorry, that we believe that the collective voice uh, is strengthened by uh, the the strengthening of individual voices, uh, and so it is. Uh, and so, like Kay was saying, uh, this is. Uh, one of Kay's uh, initial introductions uh, to the community as a whole, uh, as far as being, uh, as far as on the speaking level. Uh, one of the, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. We are we are doing this one a little bit late at night here. Uh, we doing recording this one late at night, but we'll. Uh, it, this these these pop up pop up pretty quickly after you record them too and uh, and publish them so people will be able to listen to this in the early morning hours. Uh, it is day two hundred and fifty one of Occupy City Hall in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, I think we want to make sure with these live these live from Occupy City Hall podcast we want to make sure that we're touching on the recent events that have just taken place uh, in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, so that way people that are tuning into this podcast uh can be kept abreast as to uh, all of the the political issues and all of the things going on around the occupation and so with that being said i think that we have to we cannot start out talking about day 200 and we cannot start out day 251 without speaking about what took place on day 250 which was the ninth desecration uh, again, that is the ninth desecration of the memorials that have been put up at Say Their Name Square. Now, for people who may be listening to this and uh, do not know what Say Their Name Square is, uh, Say Their Name Square is uh, an area that is uh, outside of City Hall in Rockford, Illinois, near the occupation. Uh, Say Their Name Square is a four-block uh, radius, uh, four, four block radius. Uh, and on each one of the corners, there are memorials on the light poles of uh, victims of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in the city of Rockford, Illinois, and in Winnebago, in the Winnebago County area. Uh, we have a memorial for Mark Barmore, who was uh, killed by the Rockford Police Department. Uh, the uh, the city of Rockford and or the Rockford Police Department have now torn down and desecrated that memorial nine times tearing the memorial down throwing the picture in the trash throwing the name in the trash we've had candles and stuffed animals and flowers and they've thrown all those things in the trash uh logan bell was killed by the rockford police department they de desecrated his memorial for the ninth time carrie blake was killed by the rockford police department they've de de uh, desecrated his memorial for the ninth time michael sago jr was killed by the rockford police department they desecrated his memorial for the ninth time uh, Suzette Babbler was killed by the Love Park Police Department. They desecrated her memorial uh, for, I believe, the seventh time. I don't think hers have, has been desecrated as many times as some of the others. Uh, and I could the list goes on for each one of these 15 people. Uh, the, the, this is the, the umpteenth time that the memorial their memorial has been desecrated. And again, I think people should know that the area that we have these memorials in uh, uh, downtown is an area that has a lot of foot traffic. Uh, this area has been uh, deemed uh, the heart of the city uh, by uh, before by in different news stories and uh, by different city workers. Uh, and that is the reason that we have put these memorials in this area because we want uh, the heart of the we want people to see 
what uh, the the other part of the heart of this city. They're used to seeing a very specific part, and we want them to see the other part. Uh, and so there was a, a Trucks and Tunes events today as well. Uh, me and Terry, but we talked, and we believe the reason that they tore down the memorials was to make sure people at the Trucks and Tunes event did not see those memorials. Uh, and so... What, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Kay. Uh, tell me your thoughts about them tearing down the memorials. Tell me how you would feel uh, if one, if if a loved one of yours memorial was being torn down and you were seeing it online. Uh, and then tell me how you feel personally about these memorials being torn down because you've met uh, some of these families now because you are yeah you are very you are deeply involved. You are an intricate. Uh, part of this organization uh, that and this organization is deeply involved with these issues so just tell me tell me uh some of those things how would you feel about these if this is your family how do you feel about them in general with you being involved at this level and what's some of your thoughts about these memorials being torn down okay i strongly feel that um, as leslie said this is the ninth time that they've torn them down i feel that the city doesn't um they don't try to sugarcoat or hide the fact that they feel like it's an inconvenience. Um, I feel that, again, coming from a much larger city, a much more progressive city, I, I, I feel that uh, what the black and Latino community are used to having, uh, used to having uh, given to them by way of the... Uh, the politics of the city uh, is greatly lacking, greatly lacking, and uh, that's no exaggeration. I mean, to put this city on par with other cities, uh, in many instances, I feel like I'm in the South, and, and I really do mean that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a negative kind of connotation, but I am saying that based on certain areas that have higher levels of racism, higher levels of prejudice, higher levels of bigotry. Um, a lot of people, white and black, acknowledge this. Uh, mainly when you watch the, the news uh, Facebook posts, uh, if you ever watch a news article that talks about race or uh, pull up older articles based on these shootings, based on um, the protesting last year, just scroll down and read the comments. Um, you, you'll definitely see that, uh, in many instances, people don't, they hide behind being online. So they speak exactly how they feel. And, uh, I've learned by being in Rockford, uh, unfortunately, and this is, I, I wouldn't even say, well, my opinion, I'm saying based on the volume, um, I feel that Rockford is a very prejudiced town very i believe statistically rockford is ranked ninth worst city in america for black people to uh strive and achieve um i may have to, i will go back and check those stats but uh i believe one of the last uh one of my last uh searches led me on a list of the top 20 and i believe rockford ranked in the top 10 um, so um, it goes without saying that it's not a black man's perspective of a personal opinion. Uh, uh, I, I do my absolute best to not base what I speak on based on how I feel or what I think, but based on facts. Uh, facts, people, facts may trigger people's feelings and emotions. But at the end of the day, ultimately, a fact is a fact. It has no bearing on whether a person believes it or not. Uh, a fact is simply that. Uh, in regards to these uh, memorials, I feel that the city has never addressed, uh, has never truly addressed the human element of the losses. I don't, I, I don't feel that the city has really... Uh, approach the families enough in regards to the humanity of the lives lost even uh, recently over the last few weeks uh it's it's numbing 
to me as a black man in America to see the apathy of white America and the microcosm of the apathy of Rockford, Illinois, the apathy of many of the politicians, the apathy of many police officers, uh, the ap apathy of uh, a very large cross-section of the society. Uh, I think when it comes to political correctness, no one wants to be deemed a bigot, a racist, a uh, uh, prejudice. Uh, it seems that even really the staunchest white supremacist would be offended if you called him to his face a white supremacist, but yet if he's spewing the rhetoric of white supremacy, if it looks like a snake and it hisses like a snake, it uh, is a snake. Um, I feel that America at this stage of its life cycle uh, is bearing openly its prejudices, racism, and bigotry on open display. Um, and I don't, I honestly don't, don't care about people's opinions because again, we're, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to put myself in a position of a battle of words based on opinions and feelings. Racism is not based on a person's feelings or opinion. America was founded on white supremacist ideology. It exists on white supremacist ideology. The entire judicial system, the police force, was created by slaves, uh, slave catching, and slave patrols. Um, it, this nation operates on a level of suppression of non-white populations, whether they're indigenous, Asian, black, Latino, Hispanic, you name it. It is, the, it is the hierarchy of superiority and everyone that is non-white being uh, suppressed and deemed inferior uh, on a social level, economic level, so on and so forth. So it's not a matter of a perspective of, well, that's what you think. Rockford's black population has a very uh, limited economic base, a very limited political uh, power, very limited pol political leverage whether it be uh, ministry, whether it be politics. Uh, there is no black chamber of commerce in Rockford uh, at this time currently. Uh, and I think that's telling in regards to just the volume of, of business here. But I, I, I honestly feel that Rockford was deeply impacted by the war on drugs, which was literally a war on the, war on the black family in America all through the 80s, all through the 90s, up to the current. I mean, for it to be common knowledge that the war on drugs was literally a war on the black family, a war on the black family unit, a war on the black male. Uh, it just shows that America has this fascination with monetizing black people, capitalizing on black, black people at uh, to their detriment. Uh, whether it was slavery, a, a redlining, uh, Jim Crow, sharecropping, war on drugs, and currently. I mean, for the nation to even go so far as to really paint the picture that Black Lives Matter uh, became a trigger word. Uh, I can tell uh, the, the listeners here, we did not receive a check from the organization Black Lives Matter, nor are we members of the organization Black Lives Matter. Um, there was no money directly allocated to us from that organization, nor did we seek money from the organization. For us to individually as black people say that our lives matter, it was drowned out through rhetoric of, well, but all lives matter. All lives should matter, but all lives don't matter. Because if all lives mattered, where's the public outcry for innocent people, even in Rockford, being shot? There is no public outcry. What you see on the media constantly is, well, he must have done something to deserve that. But what about his day in court? What about their day in court? What about their equal justice under the law? It, it somehow gets gets uh, watered down to the point of if someone's gunned down in cold blood, they deserved it somehow, and it was okay. Uh, the memorials is a shocking testament to me in full display as far as how the the politics of Rockford views the memorials as well as the police force that it's it's definitely considered an inconvenience to look at 
Um, uh, to even hear the one officer call it junk or garbage is very telling. He was one of the superior officers and he called it garbage, called it junk. Uh, I think very candidly, if we could actually hear uh, publicly people's views, uh, some of the officers' views on how they view the black population in Rockford, it would be very telling. Uh, I think they view us very animalistically, uh, whether they, I think in a sense, they view themselves being in a zoo uh, and us being subhuman or less than human or less than mentally capable or having the same capacity. Uh, and I feel we're also viewed in many instances as less deserving of love or compassion. Um, and these memorials have been torn down nine times. And uh, at each time, there was no sense at all of remorse, no sense of even just human dignity of, wow, um, I'm tearing this down, but it really bothers me to do this. It was almost a sense of all in a day's work. It's, it's not personal to me. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just stuff or to some officers, I'm sure, as it was stated verbally and it was on video junk to some of them it's just junk um and it's sad in the wake of george floyd and the 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 visibility of the case and what's come down on a national level that it's again it's very telling on a local level in rockford to show just how far rockford still hasn't come for the local uh uh black population in really prog a progressive movement in this regard Just uh, let me see where. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> again, we are. Uh, this is the live from Occupy City Hall podcast. Uh, this is the premiere episode. This is Leslie and Kay of the May 30th Alliance here, and Kay was just speaking on the uh, ninth desecration of the memorials that say their name square, and you know I uh, <clears throat> I agree with you know everything that it is that. Uh, you know, Kay spoke there. I, I agree with everything that it is that Kay spoke there. He uh, uh, made some very poignant uh, observations. Uh, I think that one of the things that we uh, that I've that I've personally felt uh, as the memorials have been torn down is uh, the uh, deep coordination between, excuse me, the not only just the Rockford Police Department and Winnebago County Sheriff deputies. Uh, and the uh, co correctional officers as far as, uh, you know, the law enforcement uh, uh, connection or the law enforcement uh, conspiring together. But also uh, seeing now this, the seeing when the with these memorials being torn down, the city of the city government and the city of Rockford and Rockford uh, city employees and public works employees also being part of this. Uh, conspiring with the uh, law enforcement uh, and then the state's attorney conspiring with them as well. And you just see this this web of this web of white supremacy uh, and you see how deeply it's used and you see how uh, I, you see how much. Uh, power that they that they that they truly yield, uh, wield and you see the, the the manners in which they wield it. You know, the uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, we've had multiple different versions of these uh, memorials being torn down. It's been times where these memorials have been torn down by city workers only. It's been time when these memorials were torn down with city workers being basically guarded by police officers or police officers, uh, you know, uh, circling or surveilling while these city workers tear down these memorials. Uh, there's been times when the police officers have torn down the memorials in the middle of the night. Uh, it's been times when... Uh, the police officers, one time the police officers came and tore down the canopy and in the midst of them tearing down the canopy, the city workers tried to use that as a distraction to go then and tear down the memorials. Uh, it's been one time when we were in the back of City Hall and they put somebody inside that was working in City Hall to sort of be a lookout uh, so that way they could try to sneak and tear down a memorial so that and, why, and, and we wouldn't be able to film them. Uh, luck, film them. Luckily, we were able to uh, realized they, that they were tearing down the memorials and able to capture it on film. Uh, 
I think uh, another one of the things that uh, uh, happened, went, well, not uh, a thing that happened today that also uh, made me think that we are gaining ground with these memorials being put up, even as these uh, as the institution as these institutions tear them down, is that as the as the memorials were being torn down by city workers this morning uh, on day 250 of the occupation. Uh, a woman drove by, a white woman drove by, and she had a, a, at least one child in the car with her, and she had her window down, and I was filming them as they were tearing down the memorials. Uh, and the woman asked, she said, are they tearing, down, are they tearing those down? Uh, I said, yes, they are. And she said, shame, shame on you, shame, shame on you. Uh, she said that, as the, and then she drove off, and she just said that to him as she was driving away. And I think that that just let me know that there are people paying attention. There are people... Uh, that are uh, that are listening. There are people who are uh, are empathizing with these situations, and I think that it, it is it is our responsibility and it is our duty to continue uh, to persevere uh, through no matter what comes next. Uh, the worst thing I think that we can do at this at this time in Rockford, Illinois, would be to turn around. Would be to become stagnant. Uh, we have to continue to push forward. Uh, we will put these memorials back up here on Say Their Name Square. And whenever they tear them down again, we will put them back up. And we will make sure that uh, not just the city of Rockford knows uh, about these things, not just Winnebago County knows about these things, but all of Illinois and all of this nation and then all of the world knows about the actions of uh, these this, these. Uh, uh, racist city of Rockford government employees and racist uh, law enforcement uh, branches of the city of Rockford. Uh, now, with, with, I sort of want to close off on the memorials uh, in sort of uh, a position to a, a different topic. Uh, and I think that that, that topic is sort of uh, the chalk that we've been using. Uh, you've been, what's been some of your... Uh, interactions with people or what's been some of your observations of people when they come dot by city hall and they and they see the chalk or they come by the area of say their name square and see some of the chalk um oh, I, I think the most down. the most telling uh moment the most telling moment in regards to the chalk that i've noticed is i've seen people literally hop off of it as if they're not supposed to walk on it so uh, some of them it's out of respect they would look at it start reading it, and then they would literally hop off of it to not disturb the chalk, to not smudge it with their feet. Not that that was the intent, but as they're walking across it, they jumped off of it as if to, as if to say, I don't want to be disrespectful to the words that are written here. And that I appreciated because it was a genuine reaction. It wasn't something that they said. It was a literal reaction where they physically jumped off of it. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to walk on this. I don't know if I'm supposed to, uh, if it's wrong to walk on it. I'm, I'm walking and reading it because I'm going somewhere. You know, I'm going from point A to point B, but I am reading it in pieces and chunks. And uh, you can see some of it would just grab people. Um, and some people just... Uh, but yet on the on the other extreme, you see people completely uh, treated as a joke. Uh, I remember personally, I was sitting in a chair. A gentleman comes walking down the street, and he uh, it was a list of names written on the ground, and he proceeded to, I believe he was playing hopscotch or some kind of game. He made it into a game with his friends and started laughing about it. And literally, it made me think about the pictures that were turned into postcards of people pointing at dead black bodies hanging from trees where you had people in their Sunday best and their best outfits very casual uh, no major reactions on their faces some had smirks but you see them just blase attitude pointing up at lynched bodies and it just became a uh, a family affair and it, that, whenever I see those pictures, it it's moving, but it's very telling about the psychology of a nation founded on white supremacy. Um, 
we're not talking about thousands and thousands of years ago. We're talking America's younger than many churches in Europe. There are churches and buildings older than this country. Uh, and uh, I'm fascinated every time I hear a European say, <laughs> your nation is just a baby. When you talk about the good old days, and I hear Americans talk about how the the, 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 the days of times past, and the Civil War, and the Revolutionary War, and the founding of your nation, we have buildings older than your country. But in the context of time, America wants to make it seem that it happened so, so, so very long ago. And lynchings have recently stopped. But I'm, I'm using that as a reference point because... This man clearly understood that these names and the information was in regards to people who have lost their lives. But he was just an example that I saw, and I'm sure there were others, but his was very blatant in front of me. And I said, um, I said, why don't, you just, why don't you read it? It's there to read. It's not a game. This is not a joke. I said, why you're, you know, why you're, you're carrying on, why don't you read it as you play along it? read it it's meant to be read and then he stopped but he was in a group of about four or five people walking down to one of the local bars and i thought how easy was it for him to show to his friends his lack of concern lack of empathy lack of care and then make it an absolute joke and i was completely offended by it i was offended by every family that has lost someone and uh I, I spoke without even thinking, really. It's just my, my response came from the heart. It was completely offensive. It's no different than someone spitting on someone's grave or walking across a grave and kicking the, the headstone over. That's how I felt. Because I started seeing people's mothers and the brothers and family members that walk down and say, thank God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. Because this person meant something to us. Uh, and uh, it's... On a social level, what I find in Rockford, and this is very telling about this city and how far and backwards it is, it's very easy publicly through the media, whether it be social media or media, it's very easy for the powers that be to demonize people of color immediately once a life is lost. Immediately. This is before there's a court case. This is before any details are given. They're immediately demonized. Or, for whatever the reason is, very calculated and very telling, they'll go back and talk about that person's first arrest if they were a child. Now, mind you, this person may be in their 20s or 30s who was just shot, but to justify it psychologically, well, he, you know, he, he did this when he was 17 years old. But yet, as we all know, when there's a mass shooter nationally, oh, well, he acted alone, you know, he came from a great community, wife, loving kids, and you hear a completely different spin. But this is very telling on a consistent level with many of the people. Well, I can't even say many. With all the people that were impacted by the police with these memorials, they were all in some capacity demonized undeservedly. Yeah. <clears throat> We gotta get two mics out here. We gon' we gonna, we we gonna have to, we gonna have two mics out here shortly. We still it's just the beginning. These are just beginnings. These are just beginnings. Uh, we just said that because we've been passing the mic back and forth these last few times. Okay. Uh, and so, I think that uh, I think that that was a very good. Uh, I do remember uh, that uh, the moment that Kay was speaking about when he said that to the. Uh, to the man who was uh, trivializing the names and chalk. Uh, and I do believe that that is one of the things that we are here for is to uh, sometimes make people uncomfortable in certain situations. And uh, he didn't threaten the man or assault him or do anything like that. Or, But it just he just challenged this, this man who was very comfortable in his ignorance uh, and has probably uh, rarely challenged about his ignorance on these subjects. Uh, Kay challenging him uh, was very was a very impactful thing. Uh, I've had very various experiences uh, with interactions with people uh, with the chalk. I've heard I've had people who have been offended because of some of the language that has been written in the chalk, namely uh, the. Namely, fuck the police. That's been one that a lot of people have had issues with. 
Uh, and again, I tell people all the time that the first words that Denzel Duvant, who is the, for anybody who has seen this picture, but a lot of, I would think a lot of people in Rockford and the Winnebago County area have seen this picture now at this point. Uh, picture, the picture of Denzel Duvant, the first words Denzel Duvant ever said uh, that I heard were, judge that beat the fuck out of me uh that was the language that he used that was the emotion that he had and i think that and i've uh recently i was speaking to the mother of a man who was killed by the Pol rockford police department and as we were speaking i was i said something to her about the police maybe coming because some music was playing or something like that and she looked over at me and she said fuck the police uh and so that those are very uh those both of those things resonate with me very deeply uh, and I believe it's our it is our responsibility to speak the language of the victims, uh, but to try to find a way to but also at the same time as speaking the language of the victims, find a way to communicate with these workers of violence. Uh, and I have found that, uh, you know, the the chalk is not useful if people do not give a second glance to the chalk, if people do not take a, the time to read what is in the chalk. Uh, and usually cuss words get people to take a second glance, cuss words get people to stop and read. Uh, and so those have been some of my interactions with the chalk. I've, uh, I think as far as uh, positive interactions, uh, some of the most positive interactions I've had with the chalk have been watching uh, other people take pictures of the chalk, uh, uh, other people take pictures of the things that's written in chalk and take videos of, the, of us writing in chalk. I think for me, those have, that's been the, some of the other things that have been, uh, po I guess, more positive uh type of impactful things uh and again this is the live from occupy city hall podcast this is the uh first uh first episode in this series uh and now we are where it's it's 114 now day 251 it's 114 we're at 36 minutes and, fi and 59 seconds uh and then Let's see what's and then what's some of the things that we got going on. Okay, uh, let me get you want to before we wrap this one up here. You want to sort of give some of your thoughts on uh, the last city market that just passed. You were uh, I was I was in jail for the uh, last three hours of it, three four hours of it. You want to just give some of your uh, perspective on how that last city market went, and then after K gives some perspective on the most recent city market that took place. Uh, we'll wrap up this live from Occupy City Hall, and we'll start trying to do these as often as possible, the podcast. At least, hopefully, we can try to get at least a couple of them a week. Uh, but we're going to let Kay speak on his experiences at the most recent city market. Okay. And, and again, I got involved directly because I wanted I wanted the the ability to have the power, and I don't use that word lightly, to have the power to speak on events that I saw with my own twice not relying on something that I heard from someone else or watching someone else's video. When I speak on things, whether it be podcast or on video, I speak on what I saw, what I observed. And again, I, I, I don't push my feelings or my thoughts on anything. I, I'm an actual public speaker. So my focus, my point, my focus is always speaking on facts. Uh, facts trigger emotions and feelings, but that doesn't make a fact not a fact because it made someone feel a certain way. Facts are facts. Um, during this last city market, uh, I thought it was interesting uh, uh, when I personally had the megaphone and started speaking about the history of the Justice Center and the, the impact of what the city has become because of the Justice Center. A lot of people don't understand why East State is East State. It's because of the decisions to put the Justice Center strategically in the area of the city, which is actually green space, which makes no sense at all. That is the prime real estate of the city. And because they dropped the Justice Center in that region, Rockford will never get a Fortune 300 or Fortune 500 business to really garner the attention or the concern to build in any vicinity of that building. So that's 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 a key. That's not people are not 
shying away from Rockford, Rockford's downtown because of a black community or a Latino community. They're shying away specifically because of where the Justice Center has been placed. And that is key. When I started speaking on that, because I want people to understand the relevance of what we're talking about. We're not just talking about the police. The police serve a purpose to uh, in the community to basically police the black community and the the uh, Latino community to police them. That is literally their focus and their their purpose of existence in Rockford. Uh, obviously, if you have a police station, or in this case, the Justice Center, it has a certain amount of beds, and their focus is to make sure that the occupancy is at a certain level. Uh, any thriving, any bustling, any progressive city, and I said this, and I'm, I'm, I'm just repeating it now for context. I said, any city, a mark of that city's progress is a drop in crime. I'm going to say that again. To show a progressive and upwardly mobile and progressive city, one of the marks of that city is to show a consistent drop in crime. The justice center that currently exists is larger than the facility that preceded it. So not only did they say, well, we're brimming, we're, we're full to its capacity, so this justifies and warrants a larger one. The larger one was built so much larger that it's. it was as if they were projecting a worse city. Uh, it's much larger than the old one. And to see the amount of influx from not just Rockford, but the immediate area, it's a very telling sign of how the city views its minority population. It didn't flood the minority population with grants and funding because of the war on drugs, which was, the again, the war on the black family, the war on the black community. It built a larger incarceration center to basically police and incarcerate more minorities. Uh, that place functions on statistics. It functions on numbers. Um, honestly, Rockford being, if it was truly focused on a progressive city, uh, being a progressive city, it would have never, it would have never been placed there in that location. It literally wouldn't. In upstate New York, Attica is not in the middle of its city. Uh, when you say the name Attica, most people all over America understand that that is a jail. And it is a major jail in America. But Attica is in basically in the middle of a cornfield, I believe. So it just shows you the power of a name. People know about it, but it is not in a marquee piece of property to where you would mistaken it to be City Hall if you drove through the city because it was just a strategic location. The Justice Center is literally, in my opinion, where City Hall should be. The footprint of the Justice Center, in my opinion, in this city, City Hall should have been where the Justice Center is. But for people that are from here, they don't take a second thought to seeing City Hall on a side, basically a major street. But if you drove 20 miles an hour going down the street, you'd literally pass it uh, because it just blends in as a almost as an arbitrary building on the street. Um, uh, when I started speaking about the Justice Center and quotas and the policing, I was actually uh, taken aback with how many people stopped and started listening and started looking. Because I know what they were, they started thinking about, wow, you know, it does make sense that, you know, downtown all this green space, all this prime real estate, it's just stagnant. It's just sitting here. We, I mean, hey, we don't even have a casino downtown. We have a hotel that's supposed to be dovetailed with this project, but yet now they have to coordinate. The city has to coordinate through the uh, has to coordinate through its advertising and marketing for the casino and the city uh, to market its itself to 
businesses, Rockford has its work cut out for itself. It really does. And you, you, I, I, I'm telling everyone that's listening to this podcast, start looking at how much money they have to spend on marketing and what they end up spending it on. Because it's one thing to paint a pretty picture, but you have to deliver on the fact that you're selling yourself to people. They're expecting it to be shiny and nice and everything that you said it was. And that's the part where Rockford is really falling flat on its execution to follow through on on really not just saying Rockford is a great place to live and blah, 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 and yada, yada. Rockford is struggling with actually executing the reality of it because the reality is the Justice Center's footprint is detrimentally impacting every strategic major not small, major business move that can be done downtown. The casino is where the clock tower used to be. So when I started speaking about the the the, the Justice Center and policing on, on that level, it was resonating on, on an economic level with many of the white patrons of the city market. This it wasn't a direct a direction of an attack to white people. Uh, it wasn't a direct attack call it, calling all white people white supremacists or white nationalists or what have you. So the people that were guarded, because many people are guarded because they have preconceived ideas of why we're down here. Um, many people stopped. And I, I didn't have the megaphone that long. But I started speaking about the dollars and cents of the impact of the decisions of the city and how it's following through to make good on the initial dealings of having the justice center, having the amount of police, having the amount of money spent on the budget. But yet again, and I, I can't stress this enough, the hallmark of a progressive mo city moving forward is not a larger police staffing. It's not a larger police budget. It's not a larger mandate on we need more equipment. We need we need more and more more because the crime rate is not exponentially growing, outpacing their budget. So it to me there's a complete disconnect. I feel like it's it's fear mongering, honestly, to paint the picture of you know the we, we're dealing with an animalistic, gang ridden, a zoo. Of the black population and we must garner more money and more guns and bigger guns and more bullets and armor piercing bullets and uh, uh, SWAT teams, larger SWAT teams and more production to keep everyone else safe. And it's smoke and mirrors. That's not my opinion. The crime in Rockford does not warrant bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger budgets each year when the crime rate is not exponentially growing to that level but the recipe here is put less money in the schools and you will have the product of people going to the jail rockford could have easily now this point i will say this is the point that really made people stop at uh at the city market rockford had the opportunity to be a thriving college town when you hear about college towns you hear about yale you hear about princeton you hear about harvard rockford turned down the opportunity to put a major university for illinois in rockford but it shows you the the mindset of the oppression and monetizing those that you are oppressing that rockford thought that it was a better opportunity to deal with incarceration than to make this city known as a university town Again, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley. When you say those names, you know that they are the backbone of those towns are built on sports, whether it be basketball, football, gymnastics, soccer. Heavy on the sports, heavy on the academia. And what that does is it brings a certain amount of rental property because the students need to live somewhere. It brings a certain amount of restaurants because they have to eat. It brings a certain amount of nightlife. Those cities, when you talk to the mayors and you talk to the, the, the city councils, 
there those cities are thriving because the youth that are there for education that is the life force and driving force that is the lifeblood of the city that helps it grow and the outcome is a lot of those students after they get degrees many of them buy homes in the immediate area get good jobs in the immediate area or start other businesses in the media area so the ripple effect of that education the def that city being defined by that education is it's the wealth that is generated. It starts creating wealth. It starts creating wealth. Before Rockford even get to a point of cre wealth creation, it literally has to gain economics to help stabilize the destabilization of the black and Latino community here, where it's completely destabilized to the point where there's barely any black infrastructure or minority infrastructure in general whatever the minority group is there's barely any economic infrastructure here so that gained a lot of attention i wasn't yelling wasn't bashing anyone i was talking about the dollars and cents of what policing is doing to the city it's not enough to say i put two million dollars in perryville so that's still rockford that's not gonna cut it well, I, you know, I, I put some money in McChesney Park. I put some money over in Loves Park. It's almost like saying anywhere but Rockford, but yet Rockford's the greatest city in, in this region. No, that's, that's not how this works. There's no major development downtown. Again, the casino is going where the clock tower used to be. How are you going to coordinate high rollers that can afford the penthouse suites in the embassy? How do you pitch that? How do you pitch... Well, you know, I know you have about two to five thousand dollars to blow tonight, and uh, enjoy spending it. It's it's petty cash to you. Uh, you may be a multimillionaire, you may may not, but they're coming to spend the money and have a good time, just like any other casino. But when you look at that as an average of high rollers, you're looking at infrastructure. Now, again, not to take away from anything that's going on down here, it's making it all relevant. When you focus on incarceration as the backbone of your city, look at how it, it, it disrupts even the structure and growth and future of that city. The casino should have been downtown. Why? Because think about how many multiple restaurants, how many multiple nightclubs, how many multiple condos or apartments would have gone up to facilitate the money being spent at a casino. But here we are, casino down near the clock tower. So, obviously, where's that impact? Where's the money going to impact? Not downtown Rockford. It's going to impact Perryville and other suburban areas on the edge of Rockford. But yet, it's not going to economically impact or grow downtown. But yet, the embassy is downtown. Anyone that knows strategically where this casino is going, they know that there's the Red Roof Inn. There's the, I think it's the Hampton or Hyatt, Best Western, La Quinta, and on and on and on that are down there. And what most likely will happen, if you can project what's going to happen, if a person has enough money to spend two to $5,000 in a casino, they're going to just say, I don't want to go downtown to my hotel. I've been here for hours. I'm enjoying myself down here. Uh, we'll get Uber Eats or we'll eat in the casino or restaurant and let's book the penthouse in the Hampton or Hyatt. I forget whichever hotel that is down there. Let's book the penthouse. Let's just, just get a jacuzzi suite. It's walking distance from the casino. People aren't going to want to shuttle 20 minutes from the embassy down to the casino i'm sure it's going to happen they're going to have to get party buses and whatnot but rockford is so disjointed and so i'm looking for the right word and it's escaping me it's it's so impacted uh by the decisions that it's trying to make sense of a future that was built on sand It's literally trying to build a skyscraper on a foundation of sand. But then it's angry at the, the workers when they're saying this is not stable. This is not 
coming together. That when I say workers, I'm saying the community that's the public outcry saying this is not working. This is not stable. But yet they're trying to build this grand skyscraper of a future of a city on a mound of sand. This is all relevant. Everything I'm saying is relevant. Anyone can look up anything that I'm saying. The economic impact of, that they're garnering from the marketing that Rockford just got, that just hit the news this week about the marketing budget for Rockford. How do you truly market a city when the incarceration is the focal point, but you don't want to talk about it publicly, but yet you have a casino that's going to gain millions of dollars, and that money's not going to come downtown because... <laughs> you have the casino five to seven miles away from downtown Rockford and the money's going to be spent out there because I guarantee you this, whoever owns the property in that vicinity or in Perryville and in that region, their property went up the moment, the moment they break ground in this casino, whatever the property value is now, it's going to skyrocket and then people are going to come. If you build it, they will come and that's my concern about Rockford. Stop demonizing the minorities and blacks and people that are protesting saying something's wrong i'm saying and, and leslie and terry and everyone else is saying your house is on fire your house is on fire but yet you have these constituents political pundits and constituents saying but i live on the penthouse suite i can't smell the smoke and i can't see the fire how do i really know it's on fire because i'm on the ground floor and the house is on fire rockford <laughs> We're screaming it from the rooftop. The house is on fire. But you have the constituents and politicians, certain politicians that are so oblivious. But I don't live on the ground floor with you. So I can't see the flames, can't feel the heat, and I don't smell the smoke. We're all in the same house. And the house is on fire. We're uh, getting here towards the end a little bit. It's 1.34 a.m. Uh, we're at, again, this is the Occupy City Hall uh, in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, this is the first uh, episode of, uh, of Occupy City Hall, the podcast, of Live from Occupy City Hall, the podcast. Uh, again, we're going to continue to do these episodes on a regular basis to keep people up to date with all the ongoings of the uh, of the protest in the city of Rockford, Illinois. Uh, we want people to uh, listen to this and share this and uh, stay tuned. There will be a there will be another episode coming here soon. We're getting about to our uh, hour limit. So we want to encourage people to share this. We want to encourage people to uh, donate. Uh, dollar sign uh, May 30th Alliance is our cash app. Again, that's dollar sign May 30th Alliance. PayPal is May 30th Alliance at ProtonMail.com. And then you can donate on Venmo at May 30th Alliance. Uh, listen and share this. After you get done listening to this, go back and listen to some of the episodes of the, the Social Construct of Leslie. And stay tuned for more episodes from the May 30th Alliance Podcast Network. All right. Have a... I guess it's for us it's a, a night, but I guess for for you could be listening to this at any point in time. So uh, keep struggling. We outside.